Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for showing up this early in the morning. Uh, coffee is kicking in and adrenaline is definitely kicking in. So uh, I think I'm ready to do this. Um, 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 yeah, we're here to talk about uh, a film called Moses and Stories Behind the Fog, which is a transmedia project linked to the film. Um, again, my name is Fran, I'm a filmmaker. Um, and we're here today to talk about homelessness. Homelessness is a taboo. Uh, we don't talk about this. It's, it's, it's a word full of stigma and, and uh, stereotypes. And we believe that through storytelling, um, stories can break taboos. And not only taboos, they can break stereotypes. That is the main reason we are working on this film and we are working on Stories Behind the Fog. It's all about personal, compelling human narratives to break the taboo of homelessness one story at a time. So before this presentation has two parts, I'm gonna walk you guys through the film uh, called Moses. And then Ariana, my co-presenter, she's gonna introduce you uh, to Stories Behind the Fog. For the first part, uh, we're gonna be sharing with you guys uh, unreleased footage of the film. You are like literally the first audience on the planet that are gonna watch uh, some of the clips a uh, film that has been 10 years in the making. So I would like to request that, uh, you know, uh, not to record anything on the screen for this part. For the second part, you can snap as many shots as, as you want. Um, so yes, don't be like this dude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, what's crazy is that I, I have around 10 minutes to walk you uh, through 10 years of storytelling, uh, 10 years working on a story, uh, following the, the life of uh, this man called uh, Moses. Uh, as a filmmaker, I'm super interested in, in character-driven stories. I'm interested in, in human beings. I'm interested in the essence of who a person really is. I'm interested in the who. And in this case, uh, Moses' story started with uh, serendipity. I didn't know anything about Moses, and obviously Moses didn't know anything about me. And the story started back in 2007. I'm uh, originally from Spain, coming to San Francisco in 2007 to... <laughs> <laughs> it's talking about breaking stereotypes. Um, <laughs> so I came to San Francisco to study film and advertising and San Francisco was an amazing place for me. I was like literally mesmerized by the city. But I do remember two things that caught my attention. One was this, you know, the iconic fog of San Francisco and the way it would roll in, covering everything, making things invisible, making the bridge invisible, the Transamerica Pyramid, making things, beautiful things, invisible to, to our eyes. And the second thing that really caught my attention was the large number of people I would see on the streets coming from Spain to San Francisco, one of the richest cities in the world, you know, uh, coming to the wealthiest country in the world. I was not expecting so many people living on the streets. I was shocked. And I would, I would walk by all these uh, people on my way to school every day, you know, and I wonder who they are and why are they here? Uh, so I wonder about their stories and I thought in a way their, their stories are hidden too. Uh, we don't see who they are because for the most part, we just see a, a label that says homeless. And it's a stereotype that doesn't allow us to see further. So somehow these two things, the fog of San Francisco and the stories of those living on the streets came together in my mind as a metaphor uh, that we expressed in the film that we are working on. So yes, the, the stories that we don't see. Um, so my way of expressing these thoughts and these feelings back in 2007, I was going to film school, so I wanted to put into practice the, the tools that I was learning. Uh, so I wrote a screenplay for a short, short film called I Wish, which is a fiction piece about a panhandler who uh, begs in front of the fountain that is built in, in memory of Martin Luther King in downtown San Francisco. Um, and because I wanted to overcome my own fear about, you know, talking to someone on the street and because I wanted to break my own taboo about the subject, I wanted to work with a real homeless person. I didn't want to work with an actor and I was a writer. So when I talked to the director about it, he's, he told me, you're like completely nuts. But, uh, in 2007, I did a, a street casting to find my star for the short film. So this is me in 2007. And again, all these clips are 
part of the film that we're putting together. So yes, this is how Moses and I bumped into each other back in 2007 and we made the short film. And uh, I told Moses, hey, we're going to submit the film to festivals. Where can I find you if anything good happens? And then he said, uh, you can find me here on this corner where we met. I've been on this corner for the last 20 years. And I said, wow, he's been on the same freaking corner for 20 years. Um, so in the film that we're putting together, this is how we uh, convey this, this part of his life. So we started submitting the film to film festivals and we got a nomination um, for best film, uh, audience prize for best film in Spain at a huge festival in Spain. So I talked to Moses and said, hey, dude, like we are nominated for a big, big festival. Um, and back then people could vote for this award at the festival's website. So we decided to put together a campaign to make people vote uh, a campaign with zero dollars. And uh, little did we know that this campaign was going to spread like wildfire and trigger a journey of uh, um, launch. It was going to launch Moses on a 10 year journey uh, of rediscovery. So as surreal as it looks, uh, this is what happened back in 2009. So the short film, the campaign uh, triggered this series of events that no one was expecting. Uh, I was just lucky enough to, you know, to, to document this, this journey and have my camera with me. And, but li little did I know that I was going to, you know, to get myself into this story. So I got curious as a storyteller about Moses' life and, you know, who, who he was and the family he had. And, uh, uh, I learned that he was born to a very poor family in Arkansas, a family of farmers. Moses is the one on the left. And the one in the middle is, is Homer, who is his brother, who you've seen on the screen. Uh, Moses grew up without a father. Uh, he fought during the Second uh, World War. So he had an absent father. And later on in life, he came to California and he was doing great. You know, he had a family, married an amazing woman, and they had a child. Moses worked as a house painter. And, uh, you know, he was living quite the American dream until a combination of family disputes and addiction came together and he ended up homeless for 20 something years. So he would literally, um, you know, sleep on a sleeping bag for many, many years in San Francisco. So for a person like this, well, first of all, first of all would you like to know whether we won Spain, whether we won the award? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we won the award and, and, and we, we couldn't believe it and, and we won Spain. So for, for a person like Moses, you know. For a person like Moses, going to Spain was more than a trip. You know, it was like a, a dream come true. And interesting enough, Moses, he, he had spent his mind ever, ever since he was a, a teenager. And uh, he was dreaming about touching the Mediterranean some, sometime, you know, some, <laughs> uh, someday in his life. Uh, he wanted, he really wanted to see this painting by Picasso de Guernica. And, uh, and he wanted to try an authentic paella. Because according to Moses, you don't find uh, an authentic paella here in San Francisco. <laughs> so he came home and uh, this mom cooking paella for him. Uh, and I was filming all of this with my camera. Uh, I remember Moses took like three helpings of paella and then uh, <laughs> took the longest siesta that uh, you can imagine. <laughs> So the trip to Spain, um, again, became a journey of rediscovery. Moses was already on his way to, you know, reclaiming his life. And, and the, the trip to Spain gave him the courage to reconnect with his family 30 years later. So when we came back to the U.S., there was a family reunion going on in Chicago where 150 people showed up. It was a huge family reunion. And I was the only white dude filming everything. So, and, and I was speaking, speaking with an accent. So everyone was like, who the heck are you? Uh, yeah. So this Moses, uh, I'm part of his family. Uh, imagine, you know, uh, Moses seeing uh, siblings and stuff 30 years later. It was like really, really touching. And the interesting thing is that many of them didn't know anything about Moses being on the streets. So after the family reunion, the trip to Spain, the family reunion, uh, again, Moses was, you know, getting, getting uplifted and he decided to leave his room in the Tenderloin. He was living at a single room occupancy uh, that was home to his addictions. I don't know if you guys know what a single room occupancy hotel is. It's normally like a random place with lots of things going on inside, lots of drugs, 
lots of prostitution. I've seen weapons. I've seen, you know, uh, so Moses left and he wanted to go to rehab. Uh, but there was a wait. There was a wait list, and in between, he stayed with me in my house. And something really magical happened during that week that Moses stayed with me. So, by the way, Moses would take the longest showers ever, <laughs> uh, like like 30, 30 minutes. <laughs> um, so yeah, what happened was a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle uh, heard about the story and then she came to my house and she was like, what, what is this? So um, we had an interview for two hours and she brought a photographer and the photographer snapped a few pictures. And you know, we were like, okay, that's sort of cool. And we were expecting, you know, the article to come out uh, inside the paper, like a small article. And two weeks later, I got a call from Julie, you know, the cinematographer from, from, from the film is like, Francisco, like you guys are on the freaking front page of the Chronicle, what's going on? And this happened on a Saturday. So uh, because we were on the front page on a Saturday, a lot of people contact us, uh, people that have met Moses many, many years before I met. And all these people met Moses on the same street corner. I was, I was mes mesmerized as a storyteller. So these people started telling me things about Moses that I didn't know. And one of them uh, was the fact that Moses was an amazing guitar player back in the 70s. And I knew that Moses liked music because he would sing in the shower and he would sing at his panhandling spot. And we talked about music many times, but he's very humble when it comes to his own talent and he's very gifted. So I decided to dig in. And for three years, we traveled the U.S. trying to find the people that Moses played with trying to find the music that he recorded and we found them and it was a magical process we met this guy called orlando who has 18 kids and who um, played with moses back in the 70s he's an amazing gospel singer and he has original recordings from the 70s and when you hear the music you think wow um this is myron who played with moses um at Moses, uh, with Moses' band, he played with the Whispers later, later as a keyboard player and uh, also learned music from Marvin Gaye when he was a child. Uh, this is Quilling Minix, an amazing lead guitar player. This is Quilling, on the one on the left is Quilling in the 70s when he was playing with Moses. And the one on the right is, is a Quilling Minix, just a few months ago. So he also had music that they recorded. And this is Pete Miller, uh, an unbelievable character from UK. Pete Miller is a legend. He's a very private person. It took me one year to, to, to be able to interview him. And why? Because he, he played, he went on tour with the Beatles uh, back in UK and with the Rolling Stones. So he's a very private person. This person came to San Francisco in the 80s, opened a recording studio that recorded hundreds of bands in San Francisco and he happened to record Moses' music. So all of a sudden, I was listening to original recordings from the 70s and the 80s and meeting all these people. And they would say the same thing, that Moses could have made it as a musician. He was very talented and they didn't know anything about Moses being underground and homeless. So this is a glimpse into the 70s and Moses' music and the people that he played with. So yes, uh, the movie shows Moses playing music again, and then it was really magical to see uh, an artist like Moses, uh, you know, playing music after so many years. He recorded a song that he wrote for his daughter uh, when she was three years old. That is the last time when he, he saw her. And but we then now we had a copy of the song, so we went back into the studio and recorded the song uh, one last time, hoping that you know Moses' daughter can listen to it. So yeah, here we are with 600 hours of footage recorded over 10 years. Uh, we're editing the film of the San Francisco Film Society, who is uh, um, supporting the project through their amazing residency program. And um, and this this story, everyone says that changed Moses' life, but I think that changed the life of the storytellers behind the story. Um, and in my case, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't see a homeless person anymore. At the beginning, I, I would say people I'm working on a homeless story. But the more uh, I got to know about Moses' life and who he was and the fact that he was a husband and a brother and a father and a musician and a mentor, the less I would think of Moses as being just a homeless man. Uh, homelessness wasn't his identity. So we thought, wow, this is like really powerful how a story, one man's story has changed, um, you know, my perception about that reality. And we thought, well, this is way bigger than one story because San Francisco has 7,000 people living on the streets. What if we do 
why, what if we take this to the next level and, and do something bigger? What if we keep collecting the stories of 100 people uh, living on the streets? And that's how Stories Behind the Fog came into play. And my co-presenter, Ariana, is going to walk you through uh, this, this platform. Thank you so much, everyone. That works. Hi, good morning. And thank you so much, friend. That was amazing. My name is Ariana. I also came from Europe. And since I came from the Netherlands, obviously I came by bike. That's what we do. <laughs> okay, no, by plane. But anyway, uh, my husband and I came here in December 2015. Uh, so he could work for Google here. And I thought I would find a really cool tech job myself too. Uh, but I was so touched by the social inequality in this city that I decided to change my plans. And not Silicon Valley, but the Tenderloin became my new home. Uh, I started volunteering there at the Curry Senior Center, started teaching yoga and meditation, as you can see here. And because I was so touched by the stories of the people and my interactions with them, I started writing about my experiences on Medium. And that's how a friend and I got in touch. And that's also why I joined his mission for Stories Behind the Fog. Um, but what is Stories Behind the Fog? Well, very practically, it's a platform that we have documenting and sharing the stories of people that are affected by homelessness in this very city. And you might have seen some of them uh, walking on the street here towards this building. Uh, and we do that with an amazing team. Uh, this is the core team here in the middle. You see Dia, she doesn't like to be on stage. That's why I'm here, uh, but she's really, working very hard to make all of this happen. And then we have an incredible group of people that are helping us writing the stories, documenting, taking pictures, uh, and working with us in that way. And what is our mission? Well, I, I think you can kind of guess it by now. Now our mission is to humanize or even rehumanize homelessness. Um, challenging the single-minded view that people have of, from, of homelessness by rendering its entire spectrum one story at a time. And that means that we get to meet a lot of people and a lot of diverse, people with a lot of diverse backgrounds that we'll, I'll tell you about in a little bit. And our second part of, our, of this mission is to ignite more storytelling. Uh, so we want to inspire storytellers of all sorts to connect with the individuals that we get to meet uh, and, and take their stories further through any form of art that works for them. So for example, Christopher, the, the guy you see here in the picture, is the very first story I did for Stories Behind the Fog. And the image you see on the right is made by Didi, who is actually here in the room today, who was inspired by the picture and decided to use it for her artwork. And we have had many other artists doing things like that. We even have a woman who made a, a piano piece out of the inspiration of the story she was reading. So a question we very often get is how do you collect these stories? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And what's very central about what we do is community engagement. We, we don't do this alone. We work with a lot of people and a lot of great organizations. So it's already mentioning the photographers, the writers that we work with. Some of them are there for one story. Some of them stay with us for a long time. And that's, that's how I got in. Uh, and we work with a lot of the homeless outreach organizations in these cities. So we can find the stories and share them with the world. And that leads to many, many amazing things. The picture you see here is taken by an actual Pulitzer Prize nominee, Andrew Burden. And the woman you see in this picture, her name is Bonnie. And I know her from the Curry Senior Center. She used to volunteer with the Clintons and is now homeless on the streets of this very city. Um, and we're very happy that a great photographer took the time to take this beautiful image of her. And then a big shout out to the homelessness outreach organizations that we work with. Some of them are actually here today. <laughs> so if you would like to meet them and talk about what they do. Uh, North Beat Cit Citizens is here. Uh, Life Learning Academy is here. The Healing Well is here. Hamilton Families is here. So if you want to learn more, you can. And thank you so much for the great work you're doing. <laughs> So why is it so important for us to work with these organizations? Well, first of all, this is how we get access to many of the people that we've interviewed. This is how we get to know them. Uh, this is how we find the most amazing stories. 
And also they help us fact check our stories. Because as you can imagine, many of the people that are on the streets are not as easily Googleable as most of you are in the room here. And lastly, they also use the stories and the beautiful images that we have uh, to, to do some outreach, to share them in their newsletters and show the people that they work with on their websites and in other means. And then very practical, where do we share the stories? Where can you find all these people? Well, that's, we're using Medium. So if you go to storiesbehindthefog.com, this is probably what you'll see. We post a story, a new story every week. And you'll find beautiful stories there like James. James is a graphic novelist. He makes these beautiful graphic novels that you can actually buy at City Lights in North Beach. Uh, and he actually has a beautiful story that is inspired by his life in the Tenderloin. So definitely check that one out. And this again is Christopher, the first guy I interviewed, which was a big challenge for me because he, I asked him what it was like for him to be an absent father to his kids since his father was absent too. And he challenged me to think about the label I just put on him saying he's an absent father and not looking beyond that. So that was a powerful lesson for me. <laughs> We're happy to have more than 4,000 followers and tens of thousands of people that read the story and recommend them. And we have 41 stories on there so far, but we have way more stories <laughs> that we want to share, 78 stories collected so far. And what we're working towards is 100 stories that will be published in one book. And not just a book, a very, very beautiful book that we're designing right now. And it's important for us to make it really beautiful and appealing because we want to use it as a fundraising tools for the homeless outreach organizations that we work with. So to give back to the community. Some more people you'll find in this book. This is Cherry. She spent 23 years of her life in a Californian prison. She just got out and she's struggling to get her life back together. But at the same time, working on setting up a foundation for young women at risk so they don't get to live through what she had to live through. There's also Chef Richard. <laughs> he had some challenges in his marriage, ended up on the streets, and is now reclaiming his life through his passion for cooking. It's really inspiring for us to see too. And there are many, many more people, and I just want to introduce you to a few of them. This is Daniel and his little friend, Jupiter. <laughs> and Daniel had a, had a wonderful life journey going to Switzerland for his girlfriend, learning himself web design there, coming back in the dot-com age and then being evicted out of his house, getting on the streets. <coughs> Thanks to North Beach citizens, he now has a place to stay and he's getting back on his feet and it's starting his career in art. So really excited about that. We have Diana and her big dream was to be an airline stewardess. But unfortunately, she ended up on the streets too. But again, North Beach Citizens was there. And now at least she has the smile and the beautiful nails of an airline stewardess. <laughs> Gigi is an incredibly powerful woman who became a woman only a few years ago. She's a mouth musician and storyteller that's performing here in the city every week. So check it out. And her big dream is to be on the cover of the New York Times as America's storyteller. So we're hoping that that will happen one day. This is Richard. He's actually a very dedicated yoga student at the Healing Well. And he's doing that because he wants to stay healthy and fit so he can one day turn 100 years old and receive a letter from the president. Uh, although he's very happy it's not going to be this president. <laughs> But let's be honest, it's the stories we get are not all about big dreams and beautiful ambitions. There's a lot of hardship there too. This is Queen. She's a victim of domestic violence and decided that life on the streets would at least be better than the violence she had to experience at home. But life on the streets is absolutely, especially for women, not easy. Uh, this is Terry and she taught us that she was raped so many times that she decided she needed to take some self-defense classes to at least be able to do something when people attacked her. And yes, it's true. There are people out there that actually like living on the streets. This is Gypsy who said, the street, the world is my home so I can live anywhere. There's William and as a Dutch person, I'm super jealous of his bike <laughs> because his everything he needs to live is, is right there on his bike. And there's Ricky who actually sees being on the streets as an opportunity to kickstart 
his musical career because he has a big audience on the streets of San Francisco. But of course, most of the people we meet are th more thinking about how to get off the streets and how to help others to get off the streets. This is Lisa from Downtown Streets team. You might know them with the bright shirts cleaning our streets and she's leading one of the teams and championing her team members to find a home and find a stable job. And her other big dream that she's working on is creating a shelter for LGBTQ people so they have a safe community to be with. This is Terry. 18 years ago, she started the Life Learning Academy here, right here on Treasure Island. And she modeled the school in such a way that people, uh, that the kids in her school would go to a school that she had needed as a kid, learning what it's like to be part of a family, to have a role in society. And she doesn't stop there. She's actually fundraising right now to create a boarding school for the 30% of her students that don't have a stable place to live. And this is Nieves. Uh, when we asked him about his solutions for homelessness, he had many. And he said, it's so strange that people never ask people like me that actually have been on the streets or people that are currently on the streets for solutions. Uh, and he would love to talk to the rich people in the city to explain his solutions. So if anyone has Zuckerberg's phone number, <laughs> please let us know <laughs> so we can connect him. For us, uh, one of the reasons we do this is that because we see in mainstream media that the stories out, out there are very stereotypical. And we're happy to see that mainstream media and other partners are working with us to get these personal stories out there. So we actually launched our online presence during the SF Homelessness Project. Uh, so more than 80 uh, media organizations partnered there to flood the news with stories about solutions for homelessness. And we were part of that in June. Uh, and again in last December. And that triggered a series of, of events where we were invited to speak at some cool events <laughs> and also uh, do some television interviews that were really great for our outreach. And we got a partner in WeTransfer who actually uh, decided to use some of their backgrounds to share our stories. For example, Cynthia who used to work on the set of The Matrix and is now living outdoors. Or Jason, who told us that Tai Chi really helped him to deal uh, with his living on the streets. And Brianna who is actually one of the alumni of Terry's Life Learning Academy and is now studying to work with kids at risk herself. And through WeTransfer, we got about 7 million people seeing these people that are so often invisible to us. So I really hope that by now you're like, how can I get involved? Well, <laughs> The easiest thing to do, obviously, is to follow us on Medium, go to Stories Behind the Fog, and you'll be updated with all the new stories every week. Um, and if you're like, I'm interested in doing a little bit more than that, well, like I said, we're always looking for storytellers that would love to share our stories, get to meet the people, take the stories that we have further. So writers and photographers, like I mentioned, but any type of art, any type of storytelling, we're interested in doing that. We're actually working on a podcast right now. So, you know, think broadly. It's really about showing these, these amazing stories to the world in any way possible. And who knows what might happen? You might bump into Ulysses, who was, had a big career at Stanford, UC Berkeley, Columbia. He was actually the only black guy in his class at, at Berkeley. Um, and then became homeless. Um, so who knows, you might meet him and 10 years later, you're here, you've made a movie and you're talking about it. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, and of course, if you're working with a homeless outreach organization or, or no organization that we should know about, we'd love to hear that because they're essential in, in what we do. So just to summarize, yes, friend, come up here. <laughs> Stories are a great way to break taboos in many ways because they make us talk about whatever is going on that we're not comfortable talking about. And today, I have some really good news to you. You can actually talk to the subject that we've been talking about here on stage. Say hi. Some of the people we've just been talking to about are here today. James is right here in the back. Thank you so much, James. Terry from Life Learning Academy is here too. Daniel, right there in the front, with two feet on the shoulder. Diana from North Beach Citizens. William with the awesome bike is here. 
Gigi, the amazing trans transgender Gigi artist. Gigi in the back. Nervous. He's still looking for Zuckerberg's phone number. Give it to him. And also some people that we didn't mention, but Don is here too. Debbie, Debbie is here too. And of course. And Moses is also here. So going back to the beginning of the presentation, we're doing this, we're making this film, we're making stories behind the fog to show how stories can break taboos and also stereotypes. And when you break a stereotype um, by getting to know someone's life for real, this is what happens in a metaphorical way. You know, that stereotype, that label disappears and you get to see who a person really is. So you come to the conclusion that homelessness is not an identity. It's not who a person is, it's just an experience. And that's why today we put these weird name tags on you guys uh, that read, you know, what's your name? It says homeless and how are you feeling today? I'm feeling invisible. Well, that's the way we see people on the streets and that's the way people on the streets feel. So Ariane and I would like to ask everyone here today to break the taboo and the stereotype of homelessness literally. So let's, uh, let's grab our name tags and, 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 and tear them apart. All right, let's do this. One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you so much, and stand for Q&A.